Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of Bates Botanical Boot Camp. I'm Tyler Blankenship. Uh, I'm kind of the person behind the scenes usually here at the at the webinar in the nursery, but uh, today I am going to talk to you about companion planting. Uh, so companion planting is a very simple term that covers like a very wide uh, range of things. There are literally thousands of ways to companion plant. Uh, and I'm so I'm trying to hone it down to just basically the garden. <clears throat> so uh, I've prepared a little slideshow with some uh, some plants that I've kind of gathered up, and I think that that will probably be the we best way to get through it. And then if you have other questions, I can answer them the best that I can. But just know that um, you know a lot of these plants I have done like by my own self through my garden, and that's kind of how I learn. So I don't have a lot of book smarts on some of these more technical things. So. Forgive me, we'll work through it all together. So companion planting. Here I have my uh, two photos from my garden. Uh, on the left, you'll see a raised bed that I made uh, with a determinate tomato, which means it reaches a certain size, so it's, it stays bushy instead of viney. And, and al also a determinate cucumber. It's a, a bush cu cucumber. Um, and in the middle of that, that tiny little light green uh, stub, that is uh, some pesto basil. Uh, I think that when, you know, when people think companion planting, basil is one of the things that comes to mind easily as uh, one of the kind of like no-brainer companion plantings. I have to agree. I would say that I've grown tomatoes in years prior before planting basil next to them. And I've seen that there is some lightened disease pressure as I, uh, my tomato plants kind of suffered from early blight a lot. Um, and I, I have not had much, uh, dealings or issues with like white fly or horn worms either. In fact, I, I mean, my tomatoes are really low maintenance. I just kind of like let them do their thing. And I do observe them and I also uh, pluck the suckers every now and then, but that's generally what I've gotten from it. Um, another another uh, plant which you may or may not see in the background of that photo is marigold. And I genuinely annually plant marigolds. I always kind of anchor them at the corners of my beds. And my garden is really weird. I've got all these like triangular beds. Uh, I'm trying to capture water more. So, uh, I'll, I'll talk about one of these other points of companion planting later that might be beneficial for you too. On the right side, uh, you're looking at a peach tree. And this peach tree um, is, well, at the time, it was planted in 2018, so it was fairly young. It's probably like three times that size now, which is insane. But underneath it, I planted crimson clover as a cover crop. Um, and it, it, it does multiple things, which I'll get into here. So let's go on ahead and advance. Okay, the history of companion, companion planting, I'll just kind of uh, like really uh, gloss over a couple things here. Uh, obviously, I, like people have been finding ways to use uh, plants beneficially um, for a long, long time. You know, I said here that uh, eight to, eight to 10,000 years ago, we learned to domesticate the squash plant. Um, you know, possibly thousands of years before that, uh, agrarian practices. I mean, it, it just dizzies me how far back things go. Uh, so I've, I, I've read that ancient Chinese farmers used nitrogen fixing azola ferns, which are conventionally known as mosquito ferns. They kind of are a water dwelling fern, uh, with their rice crops. They block competing weeds. Um, the, the fern, pulls nitrogen from the atmosphere and sinks it into the soil, into the rice paddies, and they get an improved crop. Uh, the Three Sisters Plant Guild, which uh, a lot of you might ha be more familiar with, was uh, a Native American uh, guild. And you can look, you can, if you want to on your own time, you can look more up about plant guilds. But essentially, they're just kind of like a system of plants that work together that you can plant in different groupings uh, around your landscape. But um, 
that consisted of corn, beans, and squash. Uh, the beans, nitrogen uh, helped benefited the squash and the corn, as they pre- like especially corn needs a lot of uh, nutrients to produce its ears. Um, the squash smothers the weeds because the leaves make this really nice canopy all around and it also keeps the soil temperature cooler which in you know the south here uh, we have a big problem with uh, everything just cooking in the summer and the corn acted as a bean trellis so the beans can climb up the corn now there's probably a ratio like a perfect ratio to get to where the beans don't smother the corn and you know the the technicalities of that escape me right now but I, it's something i'd like to try in the future uh, and also English cottage gardens have used the practice uh, more recently for centuries. In, and a cottage garden could include veggies. It could just be an assortment of crazy flowers and shrubs. Um, that's kind of the, the beauty and fun of a college, cottage garden. So why companion planting? Uh, you know, I already like rotate my crops and I already change my soil out. Well, uh, I think biodiversity more than ever, especially now, um, is really key to enhancing the garden's uh, production, vitality, disease resistance. Um, it, you, interplanting these flowers and herbs uh, can deter or distract pests, can attract the beneficial pollinators that we need, can also serve as a host for native uh, uh, native insects that need that little habitat and uh, and shelter for themselves. Um, if you can utilize companion plants for shading and trellising, um, there, are, there are vines, you know, beans work really great. There are trellises that you can make where you can have almost anything that climbs go up it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a vegetable. I mean, it could be a muscadine. It could be, could be a kiwi. We have hardy kiwi that grow in the South here. Um, maximizing efficiency in a smaller space is really cool too. If you only have like a four by four garden bed to work with, you know, you could plant a marigold and then two broccoli and then uh, a couple lettuce plants and arugula. Uh, This is like a cool season planting that I'm thinking of going into summer. And you could really maximize the the available space in that little tiny bed and still get all of the benefits of maybe having some herbs in there and uh, and also attracting like some pollinators if, if you don't have that big of a planting um uh, where where like a a pollinator can find it on their own uh visual interest is another thing like i mentioned cottage gardens earlier i think um visual interest is huge uh just for me like i want to be able to lay in my hammock and look at my garden and my flowers are popping off and my veggies are popping off and and all the colors are mixing and, and it just it it just brings more ease of mind i do like the efficiency of like a row crop or you know, ordered beds. Um, but there's something to be said of breaking up the monoculture. And that's what we're trying to achieve here is polyculture, different plants, there are different benefits enhancing the other's detriments. So we just have a kind of a more efficient garden. Um, and also breaking down the traditional ideas of a flower bed and a vegetable bed. Like, why do we have to keep these super separate? I mean, yes, if you have a flower bed nearby a vegetable bed, I'm sure that you'll get pollinators into your backyard anyway. But um, why not interplant? You know, maybe the, the attractiveness of the flowers coming up above the veggies um, is what you need to kind of enhance your space. Maybe you're, again, you're trying to maximize your space and you're working with a bunch of constraints. So I'm just going to go right into the all-round um, best companion plants for vegetable gardens. Uh, basil right off the top repels whiteflies, aphids, and other uh, garden pests. Uh, the smell uh, and the flowers also uh, attract pollinators and distract, um, distract those pests as well. Borage. Um, this is one that I've planted in flower beds, but I am going to try it this year with my tomatoes and strawberries as I have a pretty huge strawberry bed. Um, it attracts attracts parasitic wasps uh, and beneficial bees, um, which uh, is it's it's a it's a one two punch. So you get the parasitic wasps that get to feed on uh, a lot of different 
types of larvae uh, of the the insects that lay eggs on the undersides of these plants. Uh, so you're you're in the same thing with other plants. I'll show you here. Like some attract ladybugs. Uh, ladybugs are also really good at uh, eating aphids as well. Um, parsley is another great one, and I. I grew parsley just on a whim. I was like, yeah, this is cool, a curly parsley. And uh, to my surprise, because I didn't know this before, uh, black swallowtail butterfly caterpillars were munching on it. And that's fine by me. You know, I've got enough parsley to go around. Um, but uh, it, it was a host plant for the swallowtail butterfly. So, wow, what a dual purpose. I have herbs and I have a host plant. And it also distracts pests when it blooms. Uh, onions. Um Onions uh, in the ground can repel uh, borers, maggots, cutworms, slugs. Um, they, uh, they, you know, pungent herbs like uh, garlic uh, or alley, in the allium family, chives, um, really do a good job in uh, masking the smell of other plants. Um, so... Uh, especially with garlic, uh, it's a good companion plant with peach trees uh, to repel the green peach aphids. And I know that peaches, especially here in the South, they're just, you know, you're going to have something going on with your peach uh, unless you're like spraying super heavily. So the best solution that you can, uh, or the best combination of things that you can do, deterrents, um, will really go a long way here sage and rosemary and i'll just say in the middle of one of my garden beds i have a huge rosemary plant i just recently kind of shaped it into a topiary so i have room underneath for all my berries to grow but uh, the rosemary has do been doing wonders at general pest deterrence and i kind of have these anchored plantings around uh most of my beds i'll have like a thyme, like a lemon thyme, or just a regular english thyme, uh a rosemary plant uh, basil. You know, some years I've grown purple basil, others it's been sweet basil, others Thai and pesto. And I try and keep that variety up um, because I know that like different animal or different insects are going to be attracted to those different uh, blooms. And that's what I want to, that's what I want. I want the most variety that gets the most pests away from the plants that I really want to succeed in my garden. Uh, mint, uh, which specifically like spearmint or peppermint or also uh, monarda, which is bee balm in that family uh, can deter aphids. Uh, monarda is also an awesome uh, hummingbird attracting flower as well as just a gorgeous looking flower. It's very unique looking to me. Um, thyme is also a good aphid and cabbage moth deterrent. Uh, sage as well is, uh, can deter cabbage moths. Um, a lot of the pungent stuff can. Uh, it's not. It's probably not going to be like a complete cure-all. Uh, you're probably going to still need to net, especially in the early season when these plants are still trying to get hardy and take off. Um, so that's an important thing to consider. Uh, nasturtium, That's this one's kind of like a borderline for me. I wanted to throw it into the flower category but because it does produce these beautiful flowers. Um, it's an edible plant. It attracts aphids and caterpillars away from veggies so it's good to plant near your your coal crops it's i plant it almost near anything um i even planted it underneath my peach tree and i just tried to see if it could climb up the the trunk of my peach uh so uh that's a good one to keep around you might want to experiment with creative trellis ideas for these too the ones that vine uh also i'm just going to mention um sweet potato even if you don't necessarily like sweet potato or you um, you, you know, you don't want a huge harvest. I mean, it will like spread like crazy, but one year I grew it and almost nothing else grew around my veggies except for sweet potato. And you also get these lovely blooms. I think they're like purplish blooms when it does flower. Uh, and it just makes a really lovely carpet that, uh, works well as a mulch too, uh, to keep things cooler. Okay. I know I'm kind of whizzing by here. Uh, cosmos. So we're going into flowers to companion plant. Most of these are just going to no-brainer attract uh, beneficial pollinators. Um, cosmos has the added benefit of attracting those parasitic wasps. Hoverflies, which also feast on aphids. Um, and uh, pollinators. I 
have used botanical interest seeds and just sprinkle them out and just it's kind of like the the cosmos random generator let's see what we get this year and it's always cool to see which colors come up and sometimes different colors come up each year um, if you just let them reseed then they'll just kind of come back up naturally uh, in your garden um, crimson clover is a huge one uh, and I've gotten it from seed from botanical interests. It is a really amazing nitrogen fixer. It usually you sow the seed in like October, uh, and it kind of it starts popping up. And then over the winter, it kind of you know you're like, oh, I don't know if this is going to die or not. This is crazy. But it takes the frosts, and then by the time spring comes around, it's like, shoop, you get a huge amount of growth, this big fluffy carpet of large clover leaves. And then above that, you get um, these amazing dark red blooms. And last year I grew a patch um, on my side yard and I could hear like to my ears, like a large swarm of bees that were just all over it. And if you put your head down, you would see there'd be multiple bees per flower. And it's a really incredible uh, plant. And then at the end of it, you chop it with a weed eater or machete or whatever. And all of that green material, and you want to chop it before it seeds, all of that green material then can be turned into your garden. And it, it composts in very well. Uh, daisies are really great. I have a daisy that's planted on the border of my garden. Uh, sunflowers too. Uh, marigolds, like I said, I naturally, excuse me, use marigolds uh, around the borders of my gardens. I feel like uh, they, some of them, like African marigolds and calendula, really do a lot more than just your average variety. But I've kind of planted them all from you know French to uh, traditional to african and i just want the widest variety possible i i do also have milkweed in my garden uh it's really disturbing at the end of the season to see so many aphids on a milkweed seed pod but uh it is a really good way to attract ladybugs to feast on those aphids and because they are only really interested in the milkweed plant, they're not going to spread to your other plants in the garden. And it's also a host plant for monarch butterflies, which I'm all about more butterflies in my garden. Cabbage moths. Eh, I really wish cabbage moths weren't around, but uh, let's see. Sunflower and tithonia. So tithonia is Mexican sunflower. They just grow really tall. Uh, they're great for a trellis, great for shading, you know, the same, you could probably be smart about your tomatoes and your beans, uh, like the way that you grow them or trellis them to either, you know, create more shade, visual interest, um, you know, get creative with your trellis ideas because they just need something to hold on to. Uh, use uh, soft ties. We spoke about soft ties in an earlier webinar. They're rubberized uh, metal ties that can easily be done and undone. So if you wanted to move your plant around, uh, let's see here. Boom. Oh yeah. So we need to avoid certain, uh, companions and combinations in the garden. Fennel for one, uh, it, it's roots, it's roots produce a growth inhibiting substance, uh, as well as black walnut that basically kind of stunts growth, uh, and onions and garlic with peas as well. And I will, show, I will share my links to where I got this information. Most of it was from the Farmer's Almanac, which as of March 1st, released an updated companion planting guide, which they used more uh, factual basis and scientific basis for, for their companion planting recommendations rather than you know hearsay and folklore, which I appreciate greatly because uh, I'm trying to dispel a lot of people saying, oh, companion, companion planting is a myth or, or, you know, you know, maybe you think it works, but maybe it doesn't. And, uh, and it's nice to get some people who have actually looked into this and researched it. I've also included a link from, uh, the West Virginia university extension office that has made a, a companion planting list and it's about a one pager. So I tried to make the most concise one. Um, so yeah, peas don't don't plant them with garlic or onions. Uh, potatoes with uh, with corn or other root crops, because uh, I mean corn is a huge nutrient depleter. 
I definitely plant beans with corn or some other nitrogen fixer like baptisia, which is like false indigo. Um, those will also help, especially false indigo will help tap root that soil and really allow water to, to stay as well as sinking nitrogen and beneficial nutrients for that corn. And don't forget to rotate your corn too, because you can't do corn the same year in the same place uh, unless you severely amend your soil. Um, carrots with dill. So because they're all kind of in the same family, um, there's a, there's a cross pollination risk, uh, and also reduces your overall yield because of that competition. Uh, so as a reminder, command, companion planting could kind of be seen as the icing on the cake of, of your garden. Um, you're going to want to rotate your crops. Uh, another tip that I saw in a recent homesteading book that I was reading was that you should keep a, a northeast garden bed that just rotates your tall crops like tomatoes, beans, and corn. Uh, uh, so essentially you're not shading the rest of your garden beds if you're have to, having to deal with limited sunlight. So I think, you know, as much as you want to utilize that, that shade cover, you could also, you know, keep things opened up. Uh, building good soil is also super, super important. And after having a garden for about six years in the same place and, and using the same beds, cause my beds are smaller. Um, I, I, for the first two years, I was like, gotta till it up, till that soil. Uh, and then I would mix in some compost and, and, and some other things and try and, uh, and try and lighten the soil that way. But what I noticed was that the soil was, was get, still getting hard and dry and, and compact. Uh, and there was still a lot of clay content in it. And then I, I realized that we need to top these beds with compost and layer. And what you're looking to do is build soil up, not till soil in necessarily. Um, you don't want to, open up the soil and release the nutrients and also the oxygen killing beneficial microorganisms in the soil. So I highly recommend building your soil that way, adding layers of compost, then a mulch on top, you know, might be like a light uh, pine bark mulch or some uh, composted straw and then just building on top of it. And eventually you'll just have this beautiful like crumbly soil that holds water and is very nutrient rich. Uh, and then provide good spacing for your plants. That's that's super key. You don't want to crowd your tomatoes. When I first moved into my house, there was an established garden there, but there it was like 80% tomatoes. And they were growing so close together, they were intertwining. And then a huge storm came and blew almost all of them over. And as soon as that happened, uh, and also from the rain and the wet uh, disease started running rampant and that disease can overwinter in your soil. So remember to space things adequately. Uh, and, and, you know, there are calculators to where there are calculators out there on the internet where you can calculate how much plant you would need per crop. Uh, so, you know, start small. Don't feel like you need to like plant the entire world out in your garden. And also think about um, think about growing things that aren't available in your supermarket or things that you're just super interested in and get particular. Uh, that's also a helpful way. So uh, here's my links, uh, the Old Farmer's Almanac. Um, and this, this slideshow will be available on the blog post that we will um, throw in there so you can actually click on this. Uh, and yeah, we're approaching the Q&A portion, so feel free to throw me some questions. Oh, trays of veggies are currently available at Bates Nursery right now. We've got our first two shipments of, of our annual veggies in. Uh, we have some four packs and some four inch pots. We also have some six packs of certain things. We got peppers, we got tomatoes, we got a, a lot of cold crops, even some strawberries. So I would come and check it out. Um, I'm just going to minimize my little slideshow here. And I'm going to move over to the Old Farmer's Almanac website here. Um, this is their companion planting chart. So there's a lot of other ones that I, I left off of here just because I was looking for the ones that maximize the most benefit. Um, but uh, there, there is a lot of mention here of nasturtium 
and garlic and sage, um, onions, radishes. Tips for growing rosemary. Well, we're in a really good climate for growing <laughs> rosemary. I basically five years ago bought one from a nursery. It was just a rooted cutting, stuck it in the ground. And the only thing that I have done is prune it occasionally. If there's dead wood, I prune it back. But uh, generally, they don't like it to be too moist or too dry. They will take it when it's really dry. They probably would do well in a container. Okay, Nicole, yeah, netting, um, netting, netting, there's different kinds of netting. There's like bird netting, which is kind of like a looser, bigger square. There we go. I'm holding my finger up here. And then there's insect netting, which is almost like mosquito netting and hardly lets any insects through. Now, if you're trying to get a crop that needs pollination, that's not self fertile, the insect netting probably won't be the best, but let's say that crop, um, you know, it needs insects, but you don't want the birds in. You want to go with the bird netting. Uh, it's There's also a material that is really doesn't have any net to it, and it's mostly just kind of like a fabric. Uh, it's like a white fabric that will let moisture through and light through, but not anything else. And, and uh, we sell them at the nursery, too. They're frost covers, uh, row covers. They usually have some type of framing to them that you can essentially, like, stretch out and over and then when, if it gets hot you can raise it up on the sides or on the ends and it's kind of like it's almost like a really long piece of candy if you can imagine and you tie the ends off um that's just a really good way to protect your tender growth not only from frost but from the cabbage moth which i literally saw one on the lot yesterday and those things i mean if you if you want to i mean they can do some damage and their their eggs can hatch within i think days uh, and then by then you're, you've got holes on your plants and they feed on almost anything that is leafy and green, uh, a lot in the brassica family, um, uh, you know, turnip greens, I've seen them destroy those as well. Uh, there's yellow, they're yellow eggs from underneath the leaf. So you go in there and you can literally see the eggs, you can squish them, you can pick them off, uh, you can see when the, the moth lays it. I mean, I've gone so far in my yard as to run around with a net and literally just net them and step on them because of how prolific they are. All right. Well, that was a little elaborate. Um, if your rosemary uh, usually dries out, then I'd say, I'd say you probably need to water a little bit frequently and might, you know, I don't know how big it is, but you might benefit from pruning it a little. Um, I've got mine sunken in the ground. It's in a, it's in a garden bed where I've applied a lot of mulch and a lot of compost. So, uh, it's just done really well. It looks like a, looks like a very tiny tree. Um, uh, let's see. How close would you plant a tomato and a basil plant? Um, squash and a row of trellis beans. Okay. So let's see here. So a tomato plant, uh, if it's determinate, um, it gets really bushy. You're probably looking at like two, two to three feet wide. Um, if it's indeterminate, which means it's a vine, then you can really kind of go mostly upward with it and pick off the suckers that try and come off the sides. Otherwise it will start to get bushy. Uh, you're looking at probably like 15 to 20 inches there. Uh, what I would do is plant my basil within probably 18 to 24 inches. And I think that's a good general rule of thumb because most of your garden veggie plants aren't going to get that big unless it's like a, a huge cabbage or something like that, in which case I would space that out a little bit more. And it's okay if, if like those plants are touching. Um, I, I feel like where you, where you get in trouble is having plants that are the same kind planted together really tightly. That would encourage disease and pests spreading to each one uh let's see here and as far as squash and beans um the squash if you don't run them up a trellis they'll literally run a, a run along the ground they will find something to go up um beans can easily be trellised above you can kind of plant them in the middle of your squash planting and bring them up uh in that first slide in my slideshow let's see if i can go over to it real quick um that trellis in the left photo that was a bean trellis that i had made and i planted beans at the corner each of the corners and ran them up 
Um, right now it's current. That was, this photo is showing it supporting my Blackberry. It's not a great trellis for Blackberries. All right. Let's see. Cucumber beetles. Cucumber beetles are extremely difficult. Um, I've tried, uh, and it's something that I'm still honestly fighting. I've tried uh, sprays. Uh, nothing has been super, super effective except for, I've just noticed that they're, they're around less when I planted more like nasturtium and marigold and herbs. Um, so send an info to email at batesnursery.com uh, if you want to get more specific one of our uh landscape specialists has better knowledge about cucumber beetles um oh the link for the west virginia resource i'm sorry yeah we're back at that here um growing strawberries in strawberry pots i think the strawberry pots are really cool uh because you like strawberries want are on the move they don't necessarily like come back in the same place like my whole strawberry bed is kind of shifted around and i had some lemon balm in there but it was crowding it out so i had to get rid of it so uh i think strawberry pots are cool because you can send the runners into the other holes and then they establish themselves uh literally uh, uh kind of like playing hopscotch around the pot um, I do think that they are susceptible to colonization by ants because ants are obviously interested in the berries. So I don't know if you need some kind of like separation barrier between the ground or the soil. Uh, but I've, you know, my folks have one when I was growing up and it literally turned into an ant colony. Uh, I've just been growing mine in a bed close to the ground. I netted mine. I made like a little trellis with some wire fence and then some insect netting on top to prevent the birds and the only issue I've had uh, with, with my strawberries is slugs and snails, mainly slugs, though. And uh, my recommendation for that would be crushing up eggshells. Uh, and we also have some slug repellent called Sluggo here at the nursery that might help you. Um, and there's the question about snails and stuff off your strawberries. So I hope that helps. Uh, I, I think the eggshells have been the best approach. Uh, I also, because when strawberries produce, uh, they it happens really quickly. I'm just usually out there every afternoon just picking things off and picking my crop. Uh, and if there is one on a berry, but, you know, there's others that haven't been eaten so bad, so be it. You know, they can have it. Uh, will some flowers have enough space to actually grow with tomatoes? Uh well, it depends on how you trellis your tomatoes. You know that you can grow your tomatoes to a certain height and then pinch the tip of the vine off, the growing tip, not just the little suckers that come out to the side. And then that'll, that'll actually curtail the growth of the plant. And I know that tomatoes can be scary because they grow really fast and re really vigorously, but you kind of have to be vigorous back. You know, it's just one of those things that you're like, no, I want you to go this way and you're going to go this way. Uh, and so that's why it's really important to anytime you see those little suckers coming up, just pinch them right off because it really controls the size. I had a chocolate sprinkles tomato that I grew last year and I was pinching it nonstop, but you know what? It was very well behaved and it grew straight up and it had a couple other vines that were great producers and it produced until November. Um, let's see slugs eating cabbages. Yeah, I would, I would, I mean, for me, the best technique has been crushed eggshells along the base of the plants. Uh, also, it might be, you know, if you have other moisture-rich environments nearby, like maybe you have a log pile, or maybe you have a place that just kind of stays really wet, I would avoid planting near those locations. Because if you, if you plant in a location that at least dries out a little bit more often, you'll probably have, uh, it, it, it is a slug deterrent on, on its own. Okay, mint. Does it come back an annually? Any? Yes, it does, uh, especially here. Mint uh, is super crazy, fragilistic, fast growing. Um, I planted it. I planted two different varieties. I planted peppermint and spearmint, and then I got another one, apple mint, in this one bed. It almost completely took it over. It did choke out a few things, but it kind of cohabitated. Um, if you want to harvest mint, you trim it uh, just above the first set of leaves, and I would recommend either harvesting it regularly and drying it or planting it in a container because those runners, I mean, it went under pavers. Like, it went under almost anything I had that was a border in my garden bed. Uh, so, be warned, but I love mint. 
Uh, let's see. Best plants to create shade for kale. Uh, well, so my garden actually, I'll just go back. No, I can't really see it here. Okay, just to the left of the raised bed is actually some banana trees that I planted. And I planted them on the north side of my garden. But the shade from the canopy of the banana leaves has actually been an excellent shade creator. Um, I would also say uh, you could definitely grow a row of sunflowers, maybe even some giant zinnia. Uh, maybe, maybe make a little... Um, a little like trellis that has a little roof on it or use PVC pipe and then you can run up like a squash vine or something or a cucumber. A cucumber would probably be really great uh, over the top of that so then it creates like a shade cover on top of it. And I don't know if it's in a raised bed. Uh, any, any tips to prevent Mexican squash beetle attack? Squash beetles I've had still a ton of issues with. And it's something that I'm working on in my own garden. Uh, and I don't really want to get pesticide-y with it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm almost thinking about getting a clutch of praying mantis eggs and just letting them loose because uh, it's such an issue. So I'm sorry I can't completely answer that question. Uh, let's see. Yeah, nasturtium and marigold is great. Yeah, we, we get we get uh, marigold in in four packs, and that's kind of what I love because I love getting like eight or 12 of them and just kind of spotting them around. And they get decently sized, you know, like 18 to 24 inches, uh, but it doesn't take up too much space, and they don't spread. So they're just really pretty. Uh, the French marigolds especially, they have such a vivid yellow uh, with kind of like, like purpley crimson red inner blooms. I have a raised bed due to limited space, so do you actually plant the marigolds in a pot with the veggies or in pots at the bottom of the beds? Um, you could you could plant them in pots around the bed. Uh, you could plant them in. Like I said, they don't take up too too much room. I mean, if it's a really small raised bed, I would suggest just keeping them like next to it in a pot. Uh, just make sure you keep up with watering because in the summer, the water will probably definitely um, need to be a thing. Let's see. Yes, determinate cucumber. It's, it's like a bush cucumber. We sell a variety at Bates. I think that's what I got last year. Um, not D bush, please. Okay. Just going to click on this burpee link. Here we go. Whoop. Pop up. Uh, yeah, so these are usually produced like smaller cucumbers as well. Um, and uh, you can let them grow big so they can turn into slicers. But I usually harvest them when they're like about finger size. Uh, they're, they're great. Uh, just make sure you look at the tag and really read it and make sure it says it's it's bush so you know you're not getting one that's going to spread out everywhere um robin i have not uh i have not grown okra uh, that's one that I've, i got some seeds from my friend from his garden for this year so that's what i'm going to do but i imagine it is a very uh vigorous and hardy looking plant so i would try it you know even you don't have to do it for all of them but just try and experiment and see if it works I planted nasturtiums in my squash last year and only had squash beetles about the time I was removing the plants. Well, that's that's awesome. And you know what? I just realized I did not plant nasturtium last year. I planted it underneath my peach tree, but that was about a good 15 feet away from my squash where I, I did that. So um, that is that is another thing to consider for sure. I have had a couple of successful butternut squash crops. I mean, the first year was like amazingly successful. And then the year after that, uh, you know, the blossoms were falling off. And I saw, I think, cucumber beetles were to blame for that. I'm not sure if they were cucumber or potato. Some of them look kind of similar. Uh, and then ever since then, it's kind of been a struggle. Uh, the bananas do overwinter, but they don't look good if you just let them die. <laughs> like, and I mean, die is in like the top the top growth because they are like a rhizome they live underneath the ground so it's best if you just chop them 
and then cover them up with mulch. That's what I do every year. I cover up cover them up with a nice brown mulch or a pine mulch so I know that it's going to break down and feed them. And then they will rise up again probably in late March and never stop until they get like 10 feet tall. Uh, okay. Well, if there's any other questions, go ahead and hit them up at me. I hope I've done my best to kind of give you an 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 informal look at companion planting. Um, this guide here on the Farmer's Almanac is pretty great. They have a pretty good tip category. They also have a nice little uh, video that this guy, he's a very English fellow, and he just kind of leads you through some cool stuff. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here today. <laughs> <laughs>